I had a couple of yeah, so I had a couple of um, couple of um, um, talks in, uh, here and there, and uh, uh, I met Jamal, who is a professor there, and he invited me uh, to uh, for this graduate seminar, uh, uh, which I really appreciate the opportunity. Now, um, the title of my presentation uh, would be closely. Um, uh, following my um, PhD thesis, Knowledge Representation and Artificial Intelligence for Management of Sociotechnical Risks in Mega Projects. However, um, I did um, add a little bit of uh, a twist to it towards the end on how we are basically going, how we, we've been trying to implement this uh, in, a com in a commercialized way. So um, a little bit about myself, uh, my research basically had three main focus. Uh, uh, one, uh, I, would, I would call it the knowledge domain was industrial mega projects, uh, specifically focused on mining, but industrial projects in general, I really try to understand them to know what are the risks, what are the phasing, how the industry works, how the financing of them works uh, based on risks essentially. And as far as the tools I used, um, I incorporated, um, uh, like I, could, I could basically divide them into two main categories of knowledge representations, which is um, uh, a branch of computer science called ontology engineering. I used linked data and the semantic web, um, and as well, um, a little bit of probabilistic modeling, which uh, would focus around probabilistic graphical models, Bayesian belief networks. Um, I moved a little bit towards Bayesian data science because I find it very, very interesting and uh, uh, what is called causal um, probabilistic inference. Now, um, I would this, these are the content essentially of my presentation. I would talk about the three main phases of my research, representation, inference, and learning. And towards the end, I talked about how we essentially came to uh, try to implement some of these uh, in a commercial uh, in a commercial manner within Hatch. Um, when when Jamal told me uh, about the audience here, like he said that there is a, usually a good deal of graduate students from the from the Colorado School of Mines, but as well some um, um, sometimes from the industry. I thought that perhaps um, the challenges uh, we faced in commercializing my research uh, uh, could be uh, some of the most interesting parts of the presentation. So um, uh, this is essentially the first time that I'm presenting this in this context, like moving from my thesis to how it turned out. So um, hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Uh, for, the, for the three uh, parts in the beginning, each of them could be quite in detail. I would just uh, uh, run a narrative on them quickly. And if there was any question at the end, we can definitely uh, go further in detail. There is a, one quick um, detour that we took, um, or rather, let's say tangent, that we took after presentation about mining disclosures data, which is as well very interesting. I'm going to talk about it quickly. Okay, um, so um, going forward, uh, starting with introduction, the, uh, we started the project in 2006. I was very lucky. I should have mentioned here that the project is basically, was basically a collaboration between Hatch. I used to be working at Hatch before I started my PhD, University of Toronto, and as well, we could get some uh, 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 support from the government of Canada. So it was a very interesting collaboration. The goals of the project was to design an artificially intelligent system that can reason based on project risk factors to basically predict project behavior specifically in terms of costs for financing. Now, um, in doing so, we were hoping to be able to capture historical data and knowledge about the projects, uh, identify a model project risk characteristics, uh, try to arrive at base rate probabilistic inferences on different outcomes of the project, and um, try to quantify project socio-technical uh, risks, which is a um, um, hard thing to do, I should say, because the, uh, the concept of um, such type of risks are quite definitional. It's a, it, it really depends how you look at them. And the domain of projects are quite unique. 
um, um, each project essentially is quite unique and the domain is really vast. So it was a, there was a fair amount of challenges, which I hope to touch on them, but we can um, basically delve in them a little bit more in detail uh, within the question and answers. So um, there is this, um, there is a quote that I really like uh, uh, from a book that I read, uh, and it was saying that designing an intelligent system requires three steps of representation, inference, and learning. And that is how they basically structured the book around that. So I thought, uh, as, as I was dealing with the problem of like, what is the best method? What is the best method of collecting data, of capturing data? What is the best method of learning from data and inferring from it? I really liked this, uh, this uh, basically this um, categorization into three steps of uh, uh, representation, learning, and inference. And um, so essentially, that is how I, I approach the problem. Um, uh, uh, for the representation, we created something that we called Uniform Project Ontology. For the inference part, we tried to deal with uh, Bayesian networks, as I mentioned in the context. And for the learning, um, we tried to play with, like, to find a good example that we can incorporate some of the learning algorithms. But one of the issues that we really were concerned with was the concept of remoteness for the projects. We tried to quantify it by uh, incorporating some remote sensing data that I'm going to talk about. So uh, in terms of sources of information, obviously, uh, we, had a bunch, we had an extensive uh, literature review, um, but as well, uh, again, uh, lucky, lucky for me that we, we were uh, collaborating with Hatch. Uh, we were able to reach out to the experts from Hatch uh, to learn from them, to identify the gaps essentially, and try to basically uh, navigate better uh, within, within this uh, research. So uh, at total, there was about four rounds of formal interviews that we did uh, uh, with uh, many uh, very uh, knowledgeable people in Hatch in different forms. Um, um, uh, I, I would touch on like uh, how, how, how perhaps some of these interviews changed or affect the course of the research. But it was a very interesting uh, um, rather experience for myself. Uh, it was more like a research and development project from my side because I was getting feedback on them quite extensively and were able to correct course uh, when required. So, um, okay, the first part, uh, representation, uh, what we called uniform project ontology. Um, I, I would jump into the technology part of it. So we've we like, uh, starting with this, we had a bunch of data. We were hoping to find a way to model the project, essentially, a data structure for the project. But uh, as the projects are quite complicated, we really found that uh, you, you know, sticking with the relational databases would usually uh, prove uh, um, quite um, impossible to maintain uh, as the complexity grows. So we arrived at this idea of linked data and the semantic web and ontology engineering. And the idea is quite simple. It is that instead of a table, we can basically do nodes and edges uh, to collect the data. The good thing is that you can you can uh, create this one to many, many to many, and all, to, all types of uh, really relations within the data uh, with this method. Um, so we essentially tried to play with it. Um, and then uh, we found that this is basically how we can basically deal with this complexity of the projects. Now, um, there is this, like this, this idea of linked data and the semantic web and as well ontology engineering, they used to coexist before around like, uh, let's say early 2000s in the computer science domain, but they came together uh, essentially by inventing a couple of languages that could allow to incorporate linked data with the logic of ontology engineering. So um, I list some of the advantages of them here uh, through the use of ontologies. We could uh, basically codify logical constraints within the data, which proved very, very useful for us, especially, um, uh, again, dealing with the complexity and try to partition the data based on the different groups and qualities that we want. So it, it allows us, it gives us a really, really powerful tool. And through the use of linked data, it allows us to basically increase the reusability. It is, it is almost as if we translate the data point one times for the for the system, and then the system uh, can use it based on that translation 
to search here and there to identify connections. Uh, so it is uh, basically a method of increasing interoperability. So that is how we used. Uh, so here you can see a project in our database, which would have a uh, obviously a, a sponsor, which would have a lot of projects un under his belt, but as well. Um, the, the productions, like the status of it, the cost, the country, and all that. So, and it is allowed to, to do very flexible querying within the data. Now, dealing with ontologies, generally you have to start with identifying what do you want this ontology to do for you. Mainly, we were concerned to uh, identify a way that we can normalize cost data. For most of you guys familiar with the research within the projects domain, uh, the idea of uh, comparing cost is a very, very important uh, thing. Um, usually the uh, projects are done in different parts of the world with different um, um, rather, rather escalation and inflation and exchange rates. So that was the main idea, but alongside with it, we wanted to try to um, basically codify those risk characteristics, try to come up with the, the universal definitions for them, and as well try to do some network analysis. So these are essentially the, our main um, ontology competencies that we tried to go into the problem with them. And um, I, I just here um, provided a snapshot of like how we went about this idea of different phases of a project. Now, uh, uh, you guys are most familiar, I, I would, I would uh, assume with the mining uh, terminologies of, like, of the PEA, uh, PFS and, F and uh, FFS, like full feasibility study. So essentially within the industrial domain, there is this system of gate uh, of uh, uh, rather uh, a, a, a stop gates before a project goes uh, uh, for full uh, uh, engineering design, like and detailed engineering design implementation. So the idea for us was that we could basically codify this gates in a graph uh, where uh, a project would have a status at different points in time. And at each status, it would have an estimate for, uh, for a certain distance in future. So for example, at phase one, we would have an estimate for uh, from gate D to gate G, but as well, we would have an estimate for what it would take us to do PFS from C to D. And so this allowed us basically to incorporate all the different estimates from uh, for the future points in the projects together and uh, basically unify this this data which which is quite hard to um, uh, codify and um, basically draw uh, draw a study a studies on it so um one thing that like for example something like this could help us was uh, is, is allowing to normalize as well because we would definitely have time stamps for all of these uh, these uh, cost data for for instance and then these cost data um, um, we can normalize them based on escalation rates based on local escalation rates because we have a, a specific uh, like information about their locations as well and uh, things that uh, such that to, to essentially be able to compare uh, um, apples with apples rather than apples with oranges, which I think um, is one of the one of the problems with most of the uh, project research uh, around uh, various different sectors uh, out there. So here you can see, for example, the green uh, the green is uh, the green curve is for after adjustment for uh, for escalation, and the red curve is for before. There is essentially different uh, behaviors that you would see within the data when you allow for those normalization across your uh, your database. So um, going quite fast, I would say um, this this graph of the database uh, essentially would need a would need a map would need a schema which is what uh, is called the ontology. So this is the map of the ontology. We identified three levels of uh, uh, rather inference uh, at the project level, at the project a little bit deeper level, because there is also the uh, issue of data governance and data availability. So the idea is that for the first level, the data could we could find it online. For the second level, it requires the data that for example, any engineering company would have uh, under its own uh, projects. And therefore the third level, it would get required very detailed data of the specifics of each phase, right? So um, we identified those, we identified about 150 risk characteristics uh, to be collected. 
the ontology in, in the, what is called the ontology web language is actually published online and um, it is usable. It is as well proposed to a couple of societies for uh, further development. Um, now, one of the one of the interesting things that, as I mentioned, as the competencies of this, this this sort of databases is that essentially the data that you collect will form a graph across the industry. Uh, this is, for example, the graph of company partnerships across the mining industry out of eight thousand mining projects. Um, uh, it would call the one partite mapping of the companies that they work together. And you can do all sorts of graph analysis uh, on the industry out of it. Now, for instance, the size of the nodes here is a quantity uh, that's called between the centrality, which is basically reflecting the, uh, the actual position or a strategic position of the firms within the, within the sector. And the interesting part, which is not perhaps very visible here, is that any of these like wings going out is essentially getting into a country or a regional market, uh, which is very interesting. The same thing can be done for the projects. These are some of the projects that are mostly most uh, strategically located in a sense that they bring companies together from different sides of the world, world different parts of the world, let's say. So yeah, and um, yeah, quickly the ontology is published. Uh, um, it's called, it's a, the, the, there is a quick website called aponto.link, which um, there is a presentation there and as well the ontology is there. Uh, it can be used. Uh, we are engaged in some with some different groups across companies who are trying to use it. Uh, and the research uh, is kind of still alive. I hope it will be. Um, I'm going to talk about a quick extension of it quite soon, but um, if you guys were interested, uh, um, this is an interesting, uh, um, um, let's say, uh, idea that we can collaborate on. So um, in, doing the, in doing this, I was dealing with so many different uh, data sets uh, of mining projects, essentially. I was trying to understand the different data that's out there to try to design the ontology. The ontology, uh, uh, like the design of any ontology has its own formality. So you have to understand how you, um, yeah, how you address different trade-offs within the data structure. Now, one of the data sets that I found uh, was uh, the data set of uh, mining disclosures. And that was the disclosures that the mining companies uh, who, and, and uh, governments who are voluntarily adopting uh, EITI, Extractive Industry uh, uh, Transparency Initiative, uh, would do out of the payments to each other. So governments, uh, essentially mining companies to the governments, which is basically collected at the project level. And there is as well the database of project contracts uh, that these governments and companies, they actually do. So uh, this, this data is kind of being, um, being uh, disclosed as a part of the ITI commitment. And there are certain civil society organizations, organizations such as natural resource governance, who are trying to, Natural Resource Governance Institute, who are trying to basically curate this data. So there is a very interesting data set um for basically all night all extractive resources including oil and gas and um there is as well the center at the uh, columbia university in new york uh, who is helping them in collecting this data essentially helping an nrgi and as well eiti for basically um, uh, updating the guidelines every year. So um, I basically reached out to them and I told them that I think that um, some of the data structure that we have could help essentially connect these disclosures to the contracts. So we expanded the ontology, we had the atomic levels of projects and project context and whatnot, but we expanded them to essentially be able to link the project um, payments that are generated by the project to the contract clauses so the goal would be to be able to um to do uh, rather uh, queries at the contract level to basically able to uh, to compare contracting the structures now um so this is a little bit of an example of it this is a for example a deed of transfer that actually transferred two different uh uh, projects from a few mining companies to another one. It has the governmental agency and it has as well certain fees that, uh, that was paid uh, uh, in, because of that. Uh, the, the research on this is, is still going on uh, within the University of Toronto. Um, the idea is that if we do this right and we, if we allow mapping, 
we can do what is called federated queries across linked data. And that is again, uh, speaking to that, uh, to that idea of interoperability and processability of linked data, which allows us to basically learn from different data sets. For instance, we can learn, uh, uh, we can calculate uh, the amount of royalty payments for each region of the world, and then go in from Wikipedia or like DBpedia, uh, calculate the census population of that part of the world, and then cal like come up with the uh, per capita distribution of royalties. So the idea is that we can we can federate around linked data endpoints. Um, it's a very interesting story. Again, I can I can get uh, a little bit more deep into that if there was any question. And as well, uh, there is the idea of uh, doing natural language processing a little bit more on contracts to uh, increase the utility of this. Again, as I said, this is this is a still ongoing. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the group in UFT, and hopefully there would be a publication out of it soon. So yes, yeah, so um, I should be cognizant of the time. Um, so that was the representation part. The next part, and as well that uh, tangent that I mentioned into mining disclosure. The next part would be inference, where we use Bayesian networks to try to basically now that we collect data or at least allow for collecting data on uh, these projects, socio-technical risks, how can basically we uh, draw inference from them? So um, just quickly, the idea of Bayesian networks, as again, I'm uh, sure many of you uh, within the talk are quite aware of them. They are um, allowing to do probabilistic inferences across events and as well across a bunch of, like a, let's say data. So, um, the, um, you, you could say that the Bayesian methodologies allows you to arrive at new events from old, as, at new beliefs, from old beliefs uh, given new observations, right? It's a very interesting way you can allow, you can model a real world phenomena probabilistically. And I think this is, this would prove interesting because I found many different use cases of this way of this, this, this thinking or this methodologies in, in, in the commercialization part. Uh, that I go and uh, talk about it later in this talk, right? So there are different ways of training these networks. Uh, actually, this is basically what took most of my part, my, my time dealing with dealing with them, because I was hoping to um, try to model, try to learn different ways of uh, uh, modeling Bayesian networks to be able to find the, the most appropriate way for this social technical risk that it can be reproducible and can be incorporated in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, let's say, commercial manner. So there is this one idea of ranked nodes using truncated distribution, which is basically allow us to create probabilistic networks out of score systems, right? Out of risk scores, right? And it is being used for um, what is called synthetic definition type of risk, which is quite useful. Uh, which can be quite useful for social technical type of risk, right? So we basically um, choose that at the very end. Uh, there are other combinations of noisy or, or noisy and gates, which are used for similar settings. Um, those as well could be applied. Uh, uh, we have tried with that as well, but like what I'm going to talk to you today is more going to be around this rank, no rank node system. Yep. Uh, so, um, yeah, so now uh, the question is that, okay, now we have risk factors, how the project would react. And this is a, this is a tough question because usually we don't have enough data as, uh, in, in as, as much as we want due to all the complexities that I mentioned, uh, especially for these definitional socio-technical socio risk characters. Now, again, there are ways, different ways to deal with that. My paper on this is under review. Uh, hopefully it will be uh, published soon where we engage in different methodologies. But one idea is that uh, we would have some understanding of the case specific uh, information about the project. And then we can try to build a data set of peers out of the project. And then if we can find a way to combine the two, we can basically arrive at the base rate from the data set, but then adjust it uh, either to the left or right of the mean or mode of that data set based on the specific characteristics of the project that uh, we are dealing with. Now, um, we were... Uh, uh, try to build our socio-technical risk model based on the information that we collected in the ontology to basically uh, um, uh, deal with the inside view. And as we try to uh, build the data set 
to deal uh, and do what is called Bayesian probabilistic updating to deal with the outside view and to arrive at some sort of a inference on project cost uh, behavior. So um, this idea of inside and outside view, it's, uh, it's something that's been uh, basically talked about a lot within this whole behavioral economics, um, uh, rather revolution or decision or revolution of behavioral decision sciences. The idea is that um, there are so many biases and heuristics within the human decision making that uh, if we ignore the outside view, we will be uh, basically uh, um, um, go through this unescapable uh, planning fallacy. And um, so the only way to deal with that is actually to incorporate the baseline prediction. Um, Kahneman and Tversky are the uh, basic the idea started from them and their group, uh, there is a group uh, in uh, Oxford University who are basically really uh, take this idea and brought them brought it to the uh, project, uh, really uh, project world. Now, um, the good thing, what I like about it, I, I, and I think perhaps is a little bit missing from the discussion around it, is that not only this outside view is important for uh, countering biases and heuristics, there is usually a whole lot of risks that we don't know. And um, um, there is a whole lot of unknown, rather unknown risks that this outside view can help uh, us anchor to the mean for it. And I think that is basically makes a little bit uh, more sense uh, to me, uh, other than the bias, because there might be other ways to deal with biases, but like the risk that we don't know, essentially for let's say mining project in a remote part of the world, um, are something that um, uh, like if if we can build some sort of an anchor anchor baseline for it, that'd be really really um, uh, um, useful. So uh, we took this idea again. Uh, Kahneman in his book mentioned as well that the, the, uh, once we establish this outside view, the mean should be adjusted away. Uh, it like the actually the prediction should be adjusted away from the mean in the appropriate direction. And this is as well, I thought it was missing from the discussion because uh, the, the people who are basically talking about this uh, outside view are basically uh, so far, it is more towards taking the average of the peer group and like uh, as let's say percentage cost overrun and used it a uh, blanket for everyone. However, um, there might like uh, that would basically ignore this case, a specific information that we know about the project. And my goal was to try to find a way that we can bring them together essentially as as well Kahneman himself uh, basically noted in the book. Now, um, yeah, for the inside view, uh, and again, this this is a this is a whole lot of uh, literature review, and as well uh, some of those expert interviews behind this, we arrived at a four like two different two big categories of failure drivers and failure paths for the project, and four different categories uh, uh, of risk uh, groups, and basically, and then we divided each of them to five different group categories. Right? Um, I will talk about remoteness as I mentioned a little bit more because it is basically. Uh, how like we took that and basically uh, did a little bit more um, uh, work on that the specific part because it was a big concern. And yet, so uh, we basically came up with the hier hierarchical risk structure out of these groups. Um, and as well, the, uh, in, uh, like, as I mentioned within the ontology, we collected about 150 risk characteristics, which we tried to collect all of those, or at least some of those within these groups. So these groups as well have been um, branched out to uh, incorporate other data types that we have. So, um, and for the distributional information, the outside view, we've been lucky um, to be able to collaborate with EDC, which Export Development Canada, which is a bank that uh, it's essentially Export Development Bank, who they shared with us their data set for our research. And this is their data set. It was about um, average of 27%, uh, sorry, 39% um, cost overrun through the mining projects that they had. We did as well try it with different data set, uh, but these were more uh, rather uh, licensed or pro proprietary, so we couldn't really uh, share it in the presentation. And the idea is that, yeah, so once we once we have the mean from the uh, from the reference class, we could possibly adjust it based on the risk inference that we take from our model. So, um, and as well, uh, what else we did is that we uh, we kind of wrote uh, a code uh, 
so that we can create a tabular, uh, uh, basically um, uh, tabular version of this risk 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 uh, breakdown structure, and turn it to a uh, Bayesian network based on that ranked node methodology. And here you can see the result of a sensitivity study, uh, which went into that. I should say in training this model as well, there has been a, a couple of those rounds of, um, of uh, interviews that I mentioned were basically used to train this model um, uh, with uh, uh, using analytical hierarchy process to basically establish weights for different uh, uh, parameters within the model. So um, going forward, so an interesting thing about the EDC data set uh, was that about uh, nine projects within the EDC data set we could identify uh, um, that the not only the uh, hatch had a, had an important role in those projects historically, um, but as well the uh, the higher manager project managers uh, of those engagements were still working with hatch right so that was that was very, very good because it provided us a way possibly to rather verify the results of the model. So uh, what I did is that I reached out to those uh, rather uh, people who were uh, either um, some of them were just retired or some of them were still working. And I asked them to please go through the steps of rating these projects based on the model that we have to be able to see whether our model could possibly predict the extent or the direction of the cost overrun around the mean. And out of the six projects that uh, we could basically find uh, the people who, who, who were uh, with Hatch and we could got response out from them. On five of them, uh, it, it appeared that our model basically predicted the direction of the cost overrun well. And over the uh, 11 billion uh, portfolio of, the, of all of those projects, uh, it amounted to about 400 million of saving. Now, um, this is not a full validation. Again, uh, this is more of a verification, but what we hope is that uh, with collecting more data from projects, we can arrive to a better understanding of how these rate, ratings work and as well uh, uh, adjusting our model for it because we are identifying some, some ways of basically calibrating our model based on the data that we have to basically reflect that. So uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, this is the part that uh, that the um, that I was hoping to discuss. That many of those uh, characteristics that we collected in the ontology were basically affecting the model, and we hope to arrive in a point where this model can be basically updated uh, automatically for the projects uh, during the project lifecycle. So yeah, so I think. Um, I, I should go a little bit faster here. So at, as far as the learning part, as I mentioned, remoteness was our main concern. Um, uh, we, ident we, we thought like there was an idea that perhaps uh, uh, nighttime satellite imagery could tell us something about remoteness. And we took this idea uh, and collected nighttime satellite imagery of Australia, which this, this picture is a negative of the nighttime lights. And as well, the good thing in Australia is that they had a very rigorous uh, remoteness index being done from the census data uh, essentially every, uh, every few years called ARIA. So what we were hoped to, what we, what we were able to do was to create a model based on nighttime satellite imagery that could predict ARIA. So we did this based on different types of testing, basically geographically testing, uh, collecting, like training the model for the, for the east side, uh, um, uh, uh, testing it for the west side, north side, south side, and we got some very, very good results in a sense that uh, that showed that nighttime satellite imagery could predict. Um, the uh, the essentially remoteness. So I would pass. These are a little bit uh, information about the, uh, the the modeling techniques that we use and how what proved right for them for the geographical split test. We got about eighty four percent coefficient of determination, and we did the same thing as well for. Um, North America and as well for the uh, for the correlation and we try to check the correlation for Canada and the Canadian remoteness index which got about which we got about 84% correlation and this is again one of the one of the ways that we are trying to objectify some of those inputs to our social technical risk model so um, yep i would pass this one 
Yeah, and then uh, I just want to quickly talk, as I mentioned, a little bit about the challenges. Now, when I finished my PhD, or I actually were quite close to finishing my PhD, I had engaged with discussion with the, with Hatch that, okay, so how we can do this? Um, and I should really say that I was very, very lucky to be uh, to be given the opportunity to uh, to go through the company. So I went and talked with different groups within the company to see how basically some of the stuff, uh, some of the outcomes of our research could possibly help them. Um, and here you can see some of the ideas that was developed as part of those discussions. And essentially I realized that perhaps I have most common within the risk group. There was a risk management group established within Hatch. So, uh, we decided to create what we call it a uh, risk analytics service line within the risk groups, within the risk group. And from this point on, is it, it is basically the commercialization of my research in the past year. Uh, I kind of divided them to three main systems of probabilistic risk assessment, PRA, um, uh, risk analytics systems, and virtual risk memory. We, um, so quickly, um, um, this is essentially the service lines that we could basically create out of uh, within the past year, out of the things uh, coming from our research. Um, and you can see that there is a whole lot of different collaborations within Hatch Digital to basically try to encode those models uh, to become live uh, rather in uh, dashboards or uh, con uh, control rooms or uh, things like that. And as well with different parts of the business. Uh, the main important one that I wanna highlight is the project socio-technical risk assessment, which is basically the subject of this uh, presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, in the interest of time, I would escape these few slides that I had here, basically going through any of these different things. I could perhaps talk a little bit about them more. And I have some case studies which I would es escape, but I would just talk about this one. So, um, so this is the this is the this is basically we, us trying to incorporate a, a methodology, reusable methodology around what what I just said. So we basically created the elicitation model, which allows us to do those knowledge elicitation with the expert that I mentioned in a in a more uh, rigorous way to collect ratings, both for their, uh, what is called prior, Bayesian priors, and as well, uh, what they think case specific information and collect those ratings and try to average them out using some probabilistic averaging. And as well, the inference model, which would go through that ontology, collect data, uh, on cost um, of, of the projects. And this is these are the cares that, I, as I mentioned to you, are adjusted again based on, based on certain specifics that we want. What we are hoping to do is adjusting uh, based on regions as well. And this is that Bayesian updating part that I mentioned. And then we can essentially arrive, uh, the model would essentially arrive at a certain level of uh, um, basically cost overrun based on certain uh, um, um, uh, confidence uh, in, ter in, in terms of the probability mass uh, before and after it. So um, this is again in, 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 in basically development uh, uh, and we are uh, still uh, working with EDC uh, uh, who they shared with us their data set to try to basically uh, uh, um, experiment with this model hopefully really soon. And yet there are as well training modules for the weights of those for the weights of the model that are developed. And uh, I hope that the UI can be used in similar uh, socio uh, synthetic definitional type of risk problems as well. So I guess um, I would I would uh, in the interest of time again, I would escape the rest of the, the rest of the slide. These are the, this is the uh, remoteness index for Northern Canada, uh, which is how we are again trying to input it in different decision making. And I would finish at this point, but if there was uh, any specific question, um, uh, I would delve deeper to the parts that I skipped. Thank you, Dr. Zengene, for your uh, presentation. Um, your work uh, is fascinating. And as a metallurgist, I feel like it could definitely relate to metallurgical projects as well as mining projects. Um, we do have some time for questions. Uh, the audience is welcome to chime in or type into the chat. 
Um, do we have any questions from the room? Yes, go ahead. Oh, from the room. Go ahead, Dr. Enders. Yeah, this is uh, Steve Enders. I'm the department head for mining engineering. And I'm just curious how this information or this uh, technique uh, can be used and applied on real projects. So for example, I'm, um, I, have a, I have a mining project under construction um, in Africa, and I'm wondering how this could help me. Yep. Um, so um, as I meant, yeah, that is a very, first of all, thank you very much for the question. And that is basically um, um, the goal here for us to basically develop this into a system that can be used. Now, um, the use case that we are having right now, we are developing right now is a little bit towards um, debt uh, um, uh, financing of the mining projects are focused on that. And um, the idea here is that whenever these projects are, are, are going through um, uh, certain due diligences for, uh, for uh, debt, whether they can service their debt essentially, there could be um, a more rigorous understanding of their socio-technical type of risks. And uh, as I mentioned here, we identified about 20 different uh, rather main families of socio-technical type of risks. And each of them are as well uh, uh, distributed to certain uh, participants in that group. So the idea here is that when, for example, a lender, let's say EDC, the Export Development Canada, is going through the projects, they would try to arrive with ratings based on these categories. And whenever they had data, we would incorporate the data instead of the expert judgment, for instance, for the remoteness part, right? Which, I, uh, which we basically try to learn from the information. And then based on that, um, and based on the model that we, that we create, again, the model as well is being created based on the uh, expert judgment here. So um, we would arrive at the certain uh, level of, we would predict a certain level of cost overrun for them. Um, and then that would be the basis uh, for the project to basically both uh, um, appropriate uh, cost overrun facilities and as well uh, distinguish between uh, cost of uh, financing. So that is the model, that, that, is, that is the use case that we are developing right now. As I mentioned here, uh, we are joining uh, with the Hatch Advisory Group on that, who is doing a lot of uh, learning, uh, lending uh, due diligence. Uh, so hopefully it will become part of the offering uh, offerings soon. And um, so that is, that is the use case that we are focused on it right now. Now, another, another, way, another way of incorporating this is that what I hope we arrive at it is that this model that we built, and these, these are again, those uh, 20 uh, different um, uh, risk categories. This, this model that we built hopefully can uh, collect data automatically and keep in mind that some of these data change in time. Like for example, uh, we identified a schedule overlap or uh, engineering a slippage and things like that and arrive at some sort of project risk rating that is dynamically updated throughout the project as we are going through the design and construction of the project, right? So that is also another thing that we are, uh, we are working on. Was that a, was that a good answer or do you, like, I, 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 could, I could elaborate more. <laughs> oh, that was a great answer. I'm really impressed with the work you're doing. So thank you very much for sharing with that. Sharing thank us you. Um, we had another question from an online participant and then a question in the chat. Um, trying to find, I'll read the question from the chat first. Um, the question is from Ken Kukling. Uh, the world is continually changing, so will the model need to be regularly updated or trained as specific risks increase or decrease in importance over time? Do you get that? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, that is a that is a good that is a very very good question. Um, so um, I have two things to answer that, and the, like the obvious answer to that question is yes. So essentially, um, um, dealing with these uh, uh, changing uh, environments essentially required updating of the model. Now, 
what we can do, there are, there are a couple of ways to look at this. Uh, one way of looking at this is that we can possibly try to create these models. Uh, I had a slide here, which I took out, which I thought it would be a little bit more um, uh, detailed. We can try to, we, we can try to uh, create these Bayesian models as essentially time-based entities. For instance, um, to be updated in time. So essentially we can have time as a certain dependency going forward. Right. Um, that would be the way of arriving at, that would be the way of uh, incorporating time. If we know of a certain change dynamic gradient in time, we can incorporate it explicitly. However, the other way, perhaps I think more towards the intent of the question um, is here that when in the very beginning, um, where I, I like call this is like the big map or the big idea. So I think um, none of this is really would, would be really useful unless it become really uh, become uh, established within the organization and the organizational decision making. And the learning going forward, like as we do project, if we collect that learning and incorporate it in the system, which is essentially uh, what we are planning to do in Hatch right now, we are planning to incorporate these data for every project and build upon it. So it would update it on its own as we go forward, like in an ideal world. So um, I think that is as that as well should be part of it, right? So this hopefully will be implemented in a setting that as we do more projects, we would learn and then these probabilities rather update themselves to that true probability mode, if such thing exists. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Jim. We have another question in the uh, classroom. Yes. So based on the analysis you've done so far and the history, uh, mm -hmm. what would you say are the main uh, drivers of uh, cost overruns and you know, uh, challenges you see going forward in a project based on these 20 some uh, factors you're, you're describing? That's a, that's a good question. So I can, I can tell you what um, um, basically our group of experts think, or at least the amalgamate of their opinion is. And then I can give you uh, my own opinion. So um, if, we, if we take a look at here, so these green bars are basically the second rate, uh, the, 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 the second level factors. And over here, uh, our experts think new technology is the most important driver. So dealing with new technology. After that project competition, and by that I mean regional competition that could could create could be created for a project. Uh, essentially, when there is a boom at certain part of the world, uh, um, those those like the, all the prices for like uh, would, would go up. Contractors would out outbid each other, and uh, well, basically, contractors wouldn't outbid each other. And uh, a scope definition, which is a project, uh, uh, um, uh, rather a, a measure of rigorous planning for the project. So these are the main things that are um, that are um, experts think in this model. Now, I pers what I personally think. I think that um, I think that projects are very very unique, as, especially especially these mining projects, and they are they have very many different. Uh, dimensions. Uh, there are some talks within the industry of like trying to optimize the schedules based on AI and all that. I, all, I, all I can say is that I don't believe that has that holds all the answer, right? So uh, the more that I read on these projects and try to learn about them, I, I learned that the risks are rather systematic. Uh, risk are, um, uh, um, they are not, um, Technic, technical based, at least most of the projects that, that have cost overrun, they have systematic risks. And there are some research as well to support this idea as well. I could share it with you. So um, I happen to think this, these dimensions that we, that we uh, collected are a very good uh, rather complement to those uh, schedule AI type of approaches, right? So. Um, I guess that is my um, two cents of the on the on the subject. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question.
Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, would you like to elaborate? Um, the question is regarding using these tools, not for prediction, but diagnostics. Yes, yes. And um, I should say, um, Johan and the, and the, who asked this question is a, is a really, really knowledgeable uh, uh, colleague of mine who I uh, haven't yet worked with, but I hope we, we work soon um, on an opportunity that comes forward. But yeah, definitely. So that, that, that one of the good things about this, this uh, rather Bayesian probabilistic methods is that they are essentially an algorithm for probabilistic message passing between events. It, given that like that the idea is that once we have event A given event B, now what is the probability of B given event A? And we can build this rather this relations through a network. And this is essentially what is happening here. So we are building these dimensions through a network. Now, diagnostics on socio-technical or definitional type of risks is a little bit hard, but again, it's not impossible. So what I mean, for example, here, uh, let me let me um, let me uh, full screen this one. So there are there are ways of modeling latent variables. For example, if you think competition is a latent variable, but it is it manifests itself through a scale, local escalation, a schedule overlap, and global escalation, we can essentially both uh, arrive from uh, from certain project behavior to these, which would be more of a diagnostic, but as well prediction. So the prediction would be if we have these variables, how how the how the how the uh, rather information would move uh, in this path essentially from escalation up to competition to external stress to capex, but the diagnostics then would be if we see a certain capex, how the information would move from this path. Now, what would tell us about the schedule overlap? What would tell us about global escalation? And that is that is a very very useful case uh, of uh, useful ap application for these Bayesian networks. And essentially, within more of the in, like, uh, I was I was going to mention that within the company now I'm using these Bayesian network I approaches for technical risks, right? Not necessarily project risk. And in those system diagnostics is very very real because then you see something within within the system and suddenly you can see how the posterior probabilities through through the whole system uh, would uh, has been changed essentially, and what that would tell you. So I hope, Johan, that was a good answer. And thank you for attending as well. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Zengene. Uh, we are nearing the end of our time. So I'd just like to take a moment to thank everyone for coming today. Um, the Mining Seminar Series takes place every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, whether that's daylight or standard time. Sorry for that confusion before. Um, we strive to bring you interesting speakers um, from all facets of the mining industry. You can find more information about the speaker series on the department website, mining.mines.edu, and on the department LinkedIn page. You can also view past seminars on our YouTube channel. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn for weekly updates on departmental activities, uh, including these speaker events. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, see you next week. Thank you very much. I just want to thank you guys as well for having me. Uh, I know uh, uh, Professor Rostami is on a site visit or some sort of a visit who couldn't be here, but I just want to extend my, uh, my uh, greetings to him as well. And um, yeah, if there was any question or comments or as well, if you guys thought some of, the, uh, some of these uh, research ideas are interesting and want to, want to collaborate on it, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is there, puyazangene at hatch.com. Thank you. Thanks again.